Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. <clears throat> Today, uh, we will discuss about neuroscience for coaches. And more specifically, we'll discuss about practical applications to coach the brain. Uh, welcome, I'm Geraldine, and I'm an executive coach, and I will be with you today. So, how can you get the most out of this workshop? First, be present. Be fully present in the moment. Do not multitask. Our brain is not designed to multitask. Do not hesitate to participate, ask questions in the chat, share your insights, put comments, be engaged. Take a paper and a pen and write down whatever is relevant to you and please participate to the activities. Turn on your videos. We need to see human faces these days. And turn off your mic. Okay, let's start with a brain teaser. Please listen carefully. If you have the answer, do not share it in the chat, please. Okay. A boy and his father have a car accident. The father passes away. The boy is driven to the hospital. At the hospital, when the surgeon sees a boy, the surgeon says, this is my son. I cannot operate him. Who is the surgeon? So take a minute to reflect. Who is the surgeon? You get it? You might not have it. When I, when I listened to this story the first time, I couldn't find it. I was really, it was impossible for me to find it. But when you hear the answer, you're like, oh, damn, that's so obvious. Yes, that's a mother. So why is it so difficult for many people? And I would say when I do this <clears throat> brain teaser, only 20, 25% of the people find the answer. So why, why is it so difficult for us to find this obvious answer? It's because our, of our unconscious biases, gender bias for this one. So we will look at that during this webinar, how our brain tricks our rational mind. And the objective of this webinar is to answer this question as well. How can we use our knowledge of the brain to better coach people? And we should start with our first client. Do you know who's our first client? Well, first client should be you. And I always tell my participants, try coaching yourself first. Use all the techniques, all the tools. So with the brain, uh, the structure of the brain, we look at why we resist. It's about neuroplasticity. We'll look at how we visions will in our and will describe I'm a coach. I help startup founders and leaders from scaling businesses, bring their leadership to the next level. Uh, I've worked in the finance industry for more than 15 years on transformation project, merger integration, and I've always been passionate by leadership in the workplace and coaching. I also do triathlon and I have three little kids. And I'm <clears throat> with Lily. We have co-founded Go Master Coach. And Lily, she's an amazing coach, NLP uh, master as well. She has more than 18 years in finance, tech, in sales, in biz dev, in marketing, and she graduated from three masters from three different continents. Amazing, isn't it? We created Go Master Coach. We do offer trainings to become ACC, PCC, uh, and they started at they start at they start sorry at two thousand eight hundred USD. Uh, we are the only institute with a digital toolbox. 
with many different coaching tools. We believe the future of coaching is digital and we need to get ready now. Our ecosystem is beyond diversity. Uh, I'm based in Singapore, Lily is based in Dubai, we are French <clears throat> and uh, our communities from all over the world and from different professional backgrounds as well. And this is what makes um, our community so amazing. We strongly believe in the collective intelligence. And we do have an entrepreneur mindset. We uh, always help our coaches develop their practices, develop their business. And uh, we are always keen to grow and learn how to grow and develop businesses. Okay, this is a platform we have developed. Uh, you can have access to this platform and to live classes that we do deliver live. And all our classes are based, designed and based on neuroscience principles. And you will see that today. This is our toolbox with amazing tools such as 360, personality tests, and many more. Have a look. Let's start the brain. What is neuroscience? So first and foremost, neuroscience is a study of the nervous system, including the brain, but not only the brain, the spinal cord and all the neurons. Okay, now, what is really the brain? The brain is your cheap survival tool. Thanks to this brain, we have survived. And not only we have survived, but we also have um, became the most, the strongest animals on the planet. Why? Because we know how to create alliances. We know how to understand each other. And this has made us the most uh, the strongest animal, the story, the smartest animals on the planet. How has the brain evolved? Let's look at the brain, these two parts. On the left, you have the, what we call the primal brain that includes the limbic system responsible for our emotions and the basal ganglia responsible for all our instincts and urges. On the right side, you have the rational brain <clears throat> So it's the blue part, uh, the neocortex. The primal brain is very old and a rational brain responsible for cognition is a most recent part of our brain. And these two parts compete all the time for our behavior. They try to control our behaviors and they compete. Let's look at that later on. First, what is a primal brain? So the primal brain is fast, but limited, very impulsive. On the other side, the rational brain is smart, but slow and reflective. As I mentioned earlier, primal brain is very old and the rational brain uh, is just 5 million years old. Primal brain as the rational brain and, and focus on the past, the future, and also the present. Primal brain look for familiarity. Primal brain doesn't like new things. And the rational brain look for novelty. Always on the primal brain, rational brain is not always on. Primal brain is in autopilot most of the time. Rational brain is indecisive. Primal brain is very hard to control, extremely hard, and I'm gonna show an example. However, the rational brain can be controlled to a certain extent. So let me share an example of how my, uh, the brain of my four-year-old was totally, uh, the rational brain was totally hijacked by the primal brain. So this summer we went to a park, and in this park there was this animal, and my boy, my four-year-old boy, was totally terrified, scared. And I tried to tell, to, to, to tell him, you know, it's a fake. It doesn't move. Look, no worries. There's nothing to worry. Mommy's here. Ten minutes later, it was still the same. It was still very scared. Why? Because it's primal brain that doesn't like novelty, that's here to protect him, was totally hijacking the rational brain. 
So which brand do you guys use? So let's look at this fun quiz. So describe your arguing style. Usually, <clears throat> is it loudly? You always get your say, A. Or B, you're a compromiser. How about what happens when someone makes a snarky comment? You answer, hey, how dare you speak to me like that? Or B, I'd be a bit annoyed, but I guess something is going on here. Okay, two members of your family do not get on. How do you intervene? A, you take sides, it's obvious who's right. B, I always make an effort to understand both sides. You come home to find stuff in a mess. What are your first thoughts? They will pay for that. Or something wrong must have happened today. Okay, so now count the number of A's and the number of B's. I'm sure you have uh, realized that A is the primal brain and B is more the rational brain. This is just a fun quiz to show you what it means. And Daniel Kahneman, who's a, who won, was the first psychologist who won a Nobel Prize, talk about system one and system two. Okay, now, do you know which brain, which part of the brain is associated with the subconscious? Can you guess? Well, yes, that's the primary brain, and we are at the mercy of our primary brain. And scientists have demonstrated that we make emotional decisions, and then we rationalize them, and not the other way around. So, what drives our decisions? So we know it's our subconscious, mainly over 90% of, of it. And it's all our, so our biases. So do you know how many biases we have? So we have seen one of them earlier. To, earlier. It was a gender bias. Do you know how many have been listed? 188. That's a lot from Buster Benson. So biases are the rules on which we based our decisions. So let's look at some biases. I love examples. I want you to be fully engaged here and try to think. Let's imagine you work for a large global corporation and you're given a budget of about 100K for a digital workplace solution. So you come across three intranet products. The first one is at 110K. The second is at 100K and the third at 35K. So what do you do? What is the first thing? Well, most of the people will look at option one and two. Okay, and they won't even look at option three. Why? Because they have in mind this 100K. It's the focal point, the anchor point. Is it relevant, this 100K? We don't know. This is what we call the anchoring bias. And it occurs when we rely too much on pre-existing information. So in this situation, it was 100K. Uh, when we make decisions, and think about whenever you go and buy shoes and there's something on sale, think about this anchoring bias. You might be tricked by your um, brain and marketers don't know that way too well. Let's look at another one. So we talked about the anchoring bias. Now, let me, let's say you're sick, pretty sick, and you need to get a surgery. You go to hospital A. And the surgeon say, yes, we can help you with the surgery, but the mortality rate is 10%. Would you like to be operated? Okay, you say, mm, I'm gonna go to see, to check another one. You go to the second hospital. Yes, we can help you with the surgery, but note that the survival rate is 90%. 
which one will you pick? Okay, so this uh, question was asked to two different groups of people. And I'm sure you know which one has the highest answer of yes. It's number two. But when you look at it, you realize it's exactly the same thing. Okay. Do you know what's the name of this bias? Can you guess? It's a framing bias. And uh, you know, as coaches, um, that uh, we framing is very important. The way we frame things and we reframe things, huh? it can really help, but it can also distort uh, the reality of things. And our choices are influenced by the way they are framed through different wordings, settings, and situations. Okay, now, so that was the framing bias. Let's look at this chest of drawer. This is mine. It's an Ikea one I bought 10 years ago and I built it with my husband and now I repaint it and it's broken, inside it's broken. It's very difficult to open the second and third uh, drawers, but it's very difficult for me to get rid of it. Do you know why? Do you know why it's so difficult for me? To get rid of it, it's because of a bias. And it's called the sunk cost fallacy. We call it the IKEA effect. It's very difficult to get rid of it because I've, I've invested so much time and energy. And it doesn't cost anything today that I don't want to get rid of it. So this is a simple example, but it happens in company. I used to work for a financial broker and they invested millions and millions in one project to develop a trading platform. After two years, they knew it was not working. It was a waste, but they couldn't stop it. And they keep on investing. Huh? Uh, so that's the sunk cost fallacy. Okay. Do you know which one is that? So you're on the right side. This is your beliefs, right? And you uh, try to focus only on uh, objectives and fact, uh, observations, facts that confirm your beliefs. Okay, so this is a very famous one and you need to be aware of this and you need to communicate, to educate your kids on this one. It's called the confirmation bias. Okay, you tend to search for interpret favor information in a way that confirms or supports your beliefs or values. Uh, and this, do you remember the Trump election in the US? So Facebook used this confirmation bias a lot. Okay, not Facebook, but people behind are using Facebook. Huh? Uh, just to uh, put some fit in the, for the Trump electors to put a fit that will confirm what they were already thinking. Okay, so you need to educate your kids about this bias huh? because all yeah, use this bias uh, for their own profit to manipulate thoughts. Okay, so what drives our decisions? So we are clear that it's our subconscious mind and specifically all our biases. So we have the anchoring bias, we've discussed framing bias sunk cost fallacy, confirmation bias, gender bias, and now much more. It is very fascinating. Can we overcome our biases? The answer is no, we can't. It's extremely difficult to overcome our biases because being biased is being human. But we can learn about our biases and take more time to make decisions and try to step back and pause and hmm, what's influencing my decision right now and try to understand if there's any subconscious uh, bias that's involved. Okay, and you can help your client do the same. So what are the takeaways as a code for this part? Well, most of our behaviors are driven by our unconscious mind, okay? Uh, we need to understand our cognitive biases. We cannot overcome them, but we can mitigate, I mean, we can make better decisions when we uh, educate ourselves about those biases. 
and we need to communicate to our primary brain and to our client's primary brain. How? Let's get, let's look at that later on. Okay, let's look at resistance to change. I'm gonna go quickly on this one because we know already more or less why we resist change. So how do we lead change? Think about the situation lately you had to change something. Maybe it's a project, maybe it's a behavior. How do you lead change? Do you do like that? You plan everything, you think how you're gonna do, uh, you have a three-step action plan. Is it this way? Let's say you want to lose weight. You have decided to exercise three weeks, three days per week, reduce sugar. It's gonna work, right? No, you know that it won't. No, our plan is amazing. It's just because our unconscious mind don't want it, right? And how many times have you guys tried to lose weight? I have tried many times. It's very difficult, huh? but I know the answer. I know exactly what to do and what would work. But there's a lot of things in my unconscious mind that resist. There's all those emotions, those habits that are preventing me from losing weight. So why? Why do we resist change? Why is it so difficult? Well, because the brain sends uh, uh, strong signals whenever there's something unusual, okay? So it, this, our brain sends error detection signals. And those error detection signals are closely connecting to the fear circuitry in the amygdala, the primal brain. Okay, and when we want to change, our brain is telling us no, and all the energy we have put to change is directed away and um, away from the prefrontal region, the rational brain. And what happens? Our animal instincts take over, over, right? It's extremely difficult to change our routine behaviors. And that, uh, I think the weight loss is a very simple but good example of that. Okay, let's look at neuroplasticity. So we know it's very difficult to change, but the question is, okay, how can we change? So the answer is simple, but not so simple. We can change with focused, repeated attention. Okay, we need practice again and again uh, with high density attention. So remember, when we learn to drive, right? It was very difficult. It took a lot of effort, but with practice and focus, we managed to make it very natural, okay? Um, and it's now autopilot for most of you guys. I'm sure you know how to drive. You don't even think on how to drive, okay? And it don't have to use working memory. And that's great because otherwise you'd be overwhelmed all the time, right? So you do it without thinking. I'm French and I used to go to the UK huh, very often. I lived there as well. And when I was uh, renting a car there, it was a nightmare. My working memory was totally overwhelmed again. Why? Because you need to drive on the other side of the, of the road. So I stopped. It was way too dangerous for me and people on the road. So changing habits, what does it require? Again, it's like driving a car, but this is another um, analogy. So it's like crossing this field. The first time is going to be very difficult, maybe painful. Huh? It takes lots of time. The second time is going to be a bit easier. And after 10 days, I mean, there will be a very clear path and we'll be able to run. Okay. Another analogy is romance. Think about a romance. And you know, your neural pathways are the same. And think about a romance. You meet in a cafe once. Hmm, you like the other person. You decide to come to meet the other another week, next the week after, sorry. Okay connection is starting to be established and then you meet again again and every day and then you wire together 
that's what our neurons do. They create new neural pathways, but you need to have this an intensity, this uh, repetition, and to see, to do it again and again. And then, <clears throat> you know, as I say, neurons that fire together, wire together. And it's like this couple. And that's also the reason why it's so difficult to break a relationship once it's wired it's like habits right so let's pause now and just reflect why do do you think i'm sharing so many metaphors and analogies well it's because i want to talk to your primal brain i want you to remember stories images so that you can remember much more easily the concepts Okay, so again, neurons that fire together, wire together. And this is how you can change, how you can grow. This is <clears throat> the principles of neuroplasticity. And we used to think for a very long time that our brain was hardwired. And now we know that it's not the case and it's easy, it, we, we can change. And this is a Hebb's law, and it was uh, actually it was uh, shared in the late 40s, and, and it has been corroborated by many different studies since then. Okay, so just recap, how can you help your clients climb the ladder of learning? This is what we want to do as coaches. We want to help our clients learn and grow. So you need to, you want them to move from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competence, right? How do you do that? So unconscious competence, let's take the example of the car and driving a car. Is when you're a kid, you have no idea what it means to drive a car. You're totally unconsciously incompetent. You don't know what you don't know. And then when you're 16 or 18, you start to learn. And then you realize, wow, that's so difficult. And you become aware that you lack this skill. You become consciously incompetent. Now you drive, you practice again and again, and you become consciously competent. You know, when you think about uh, um, the gears, everything, you know how to drive, but it still requires a lot of effort. Okay, and then one year later, it's totally autopilot and you, you have acquired this competence and it's totally unconscious now. You don't need to think about, about it to do it. Same for coaching, huh, if you think about it. I don't know where you guys are on your learning journey, but when you discover what coaching is, you are unconsciously incompetent. Say, wow, I thought coaching was mentoring, but actually it's not. But that's more difficult than I thought. And you learn techniques to neuroscience and say, wow, that's great, but it's not easy. And now I know how to coach, but it requires me so much effort. And when, when I am in a coaching session, which questions to ask? Oh, I need to listen actively. And then after two years, three years, maybe you become it's autopilot. You're not doing coaching anymore. You have become a coach. You're, it's a way of being. Okay, take away as a coach. So help your client practice self-directed neuroplasticity. So practice with focus. And how can we become neuroplastic? So there are many different activities you can do. Uh, like mindfulness, meditation, uh, that will help you accelerate the process. Okay, how we make decisions? Hmm, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, right? We make decisions based on emotions, and then we rationalize them. Okay. Of this quote, we are not thinking machines that feel. Rather, we are feeling things that think. Now, 
We make decisions for two reasons. First one is to avoid pain, and second is to gain pleasure. That's it. Do you know what you want more? Is it to avoid pain or to gain pleasure? Think about that. Think about your clients. What do, when they hire you, what, is, what are their primary drivers? So it was a combination of both. But what is the most pressured, pressured, uh, important one? Well, studies have demonstrated that people will do much more, much more to avoid short-term pain than they will to gain short-term pleasure. Interesting, isn't it? So try to reflect on that. How can you adjust as a coach? What does it tell you? <clears throat> well, which strategy can you implement? Let me give you an example. Huh? Think about this guy. He might run a, a red light to make a meeting on time. Do you know why? What motivates him to run a red light? It's to avoid the pain and the shame of being late. It's not that he wants to arrive on time to this meeting. It's just that he doesn't want to be blamed for this, for being late. Do you do the same when you? Uh, go home, do you run a red light to be on time for dinner? Hmm, I doubt that. Okay, so what can you do as a coach? And think about your clients. Huh? Why do they hire you? And the other day I was reflecting, one of my clients came and said, you know, I need you to help me with public speaking. I need to improve my public speaking skills. That's pretty urgent. I really want to to avoid fear and to be here and to, to be pretty assertive in meeting. I was like, hmm, why, why does he really want that very urgently? And then I, I discussed and we had this first coaching session and he told me I really need that because uh, last month I was presenting to the board meeting and I had this panic attack. I couldn't say a word. You know, I totally froze and it was so it was terrible, such a shame. And I, I'm still thinking and waking up at night because of that. So this guy decided to hire me because he didn't want to, to face this situation again. It was not to, to be very confident and to, to be admired by all his peers, right? Or the board. It was more to avoid this very difficult situation. So what you need to do as a coach, is to diagnose the pain. And this is what I did with this client. So how was it? How painful was that? What happened? How did people react? Why do we want to go through that? It's important to go through that because it will create a sense of urgency. And say, yes, oh, it was really terrible. And then I had nightmares and I was waking up and I need to change, right? And this is what we want. We want are extremely motivated to change. Of course, you don't want to, to leave them in a negative space. And what you can do is to help them, help them see the gain. So I will use visualization exercise. So, okay, now, now you're confident. Let's say in one month, next board meeting, you're very confident. Tell me, what's going on? How do you feel? What do you see around you? How do you behave? So this is what you can do. So diagnose the pain first, oops, and clarify what success looks like. And why is it so important to visualize success? Because when you do that, it will uh, activate the same part of the brain that you use when you do things when you act, okay? And it's very important when you do visualization exercises that you use all the senses. You need to, um, you need to use your uh, primal brain to communicate to the primal brain, right? Uh, you need to send the right messages to your subconscious mind. Why? Because conscious mind is a goal setter 
but the subconscious mind is a goal getter. Remember the example of the weight loss? Why is it so difficult to, wait, to lose weight? Is it because it, our subconscious mind uh, prevents us from doing that? So send the right messages to your subconscious mind. So see yourself fit, healthy, confident, uh, able to get whatever you want because you are feel so confident that's gonna help you lose weight. Okay, so take away as a coach, ask questions to diagnose the pain like a doctor would do and ask questions to clarify the gain, to create also this motivation. Okay, let's move to emotions. Okay, so let's look first at stress. I'm sure you've been stressed. You've experienced stress in the maybe in the past two weeks. Think about one situation. So when we experience stress, like this guy, huh, uh, doing a, delivering a public speaking, a public speech, just our survival instinct kick and just uh, hijack our rational brain. This is what happens. It's like there's this, uh, this tiger uh, in front of us. This is our survival instinct. And we are all different. We manage stress differently. And we can develop abilities to manage stress. And I really like this, uh, this curve from the, it's called the Yerkes Dotson Law. And it shows that there's an optimal level of stress to perform a task. So if we really want to perform, we need a bit of stress. The level will differ from one individual to another and from one task to another, obviously. But there's this optimal arousal and we will perform very well when we are here. We need a bit of stress to be at our best. But when the stress is too much, then we will enter this red um, stage where the fight, flight, or freeze response will kick in. Okay? So think about when are you when you have to do public speaking? Where just try to think huh, about your optimal level of stress to perform tasks. What is it? And it can change over time, obviously. Okay, here is my tiger. It's back. Okay, what are emotions? Do you know what are emotions? And what is the purpose of emotions? How many emotions do we feel? So let's look at that. I'm going to share five amazing facts about emotions. The first one is that emotions are electrochemical signals that flow through us all the time. We are, we are having emotions right now. Let's freeze. What is it? For me, it's excitement, I would say. How about you guys? What is it? Maybe you're surprised. You didn't know that electrochemical signals were, emotions were electrochemical signals. Okay, now, this is a very important one. So let's close. Let's, every emotion is simply a signal delivering a message. And that's a very important fact. And when I learned it, it really, really changed the way I've uh, managed my emotions. We're gonna look at the messages later on. Emotions are based on perceptions, not reality, as you know. And according, um, there are many different emotions, models of emotions, but the one I like is our eight based emotion and we'll look at them. Emotions are contagious thanks to our mirror neurons and you catch them like a virus to survive. Okay, <laughs> look at those guys. What would happen if you were in the same room? Well, if you see your face, you, you would panic suddenly panic, what's going to happen? And why is it great that you panic? Because that's the reason why you guys survived, okay? So emotions are contagious and helped us survive. 
Yes, here he is, my tiger. Okay, let's move. So this is a Robert Plutchik wheel of emotions. This is my favorite model of emotion. <clears throat> In the center, it means that the emotions are extremely intense and they are less intense um, on the outer edges. So eight basic emotions, joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, anticipation. Okay, in the middle. Let's look at each emotion and the messages. First of all, how is this design, this wheel? Each primary emotion, so let's take joy, for instance, has a polar opposite, sadness. Joy is the opposite of sadness. And why? Because from a phys physiological standpoint, you have opposite reactions. Joy, you want to connect. Sadness, you want to withdraw. Okay, let's look at another one. Fear, anger are opposites. Fear, you want to get small and hide. Anger, you want to get big and loud. So you can look at all the opposites and think about the physiological reactions. Okay, now let's go back to the messages and I love it. It's really, really impactful. And as a coach, it's extremely useful. Huh? You can ask your client, okay, what, what emotion are you feeling now? What is this emotion telling you? What is the message? And you can share this wheel of emotion after the session. So let's look at joy. So what is joy telling you? Life is going well. And how can joy help you? What is the message behind? It will help you spark creativity, connections, and it will give you a lot of energy. If we look at a negative one, so sadness, the opposite of joy, well, sadness is telling you love is going away. And how can sadness help you, you might say? Well, it says focus on what's important to you. Okay, now let's look at anger. Anger is telling you something is in the way. How can anger, anger help you? Well, it will energize you to break through this barrier, right? How about fear? Fear is telling you something I care about is at risk. And how can fear help you? What is the message? Protect what you care about. It's powerful, isn't it? So use that with your clients. You can really, I mean, you know, at the ACC level, we focus more on the problem, not the person. When you reach PCC, it's a blended approach of problem and person coaching. When you are at the MCC level, it's really about emotion, emotional shifts, energy, and this I get ready to explore, to deep, deep dive into your client's emotions. And this, those are great tools to do that. Another great uh, technique is the RAIN technique. It's a powerful one, so let's get through it. Let's imagine before this webinar, I was very stressed. Pick one strong negative emotion of yours that you felt in the past few days. I want you to feel this and to go through this uh, technique with me. <clears throat> ah, what is this emotion? Recognize it. So for me, it's stress. Stress, yes. And put a name on it, label it. That's very important. It will increase your emotional intelligence a lot if you manage to whenever you feel emotions to put a name on it you will see in one week or two how your emotional intelligence has improved second step a accept allow i was very stressed and in the past i used to say oh no that's fine i'm not stressed you know suppressing stress which is not good now i'm like okay i'm stressed I can feel it. It's okay. It's here. I will allow it. I'm stressed. It's going to go. Okay. <clears throat> A. Let's move to the I. Investigate two things. 
I investigate where, what are the physical sensations for me? So I was like stress, oh my gosh, I can feel in my belly, I can feel in my chest actually. Yes, it's here. It's, it will help you develop your interoception, your ability to connect your physical sensations to your emotion and investigate triggers. What created this stress? So for me, it was this webinar. I was extremely and then, oh, what's your webinar? And then I went, oh, wow, that's going to happen in one hour. And this triggered uh, this emotion. So now I know that whenever I do important webinar, I need just to just to go and have a walk and don't be behind my computer waiting for the webinar to the time to come. And <clears throat> non-identification. I am not a stressed person. I feel stress. That's me and that's my stress. I create distance. This is not me. I'm not a stressed person. Okay, so you are not your emotions. You cannot be fused with your emotion, right? So please try to dissociate yourself, just to float above your body, to see, to look at this emotion, create some distance. It helps a lot. Okay, I mentioned interoception. We should all learn interoception. And I'm helping my kids to really understand, to connect their physical sensation with their emotion. I think it's a skill we should all learn from a very young age. Okay. Sensation from inside the body. And as a coach, it's extremely important to develop that. Huh? We, the more advanced you are, the more you will use your intuition. And intuition, how do you know you have intuition? You have some ideas that comes, but you also can feel it in your body. And if you manage to connect what's going on in your brain with your body, you will be able to, to um, help better help your clients. Okay, take away as a coach. So make sure you do not suppress your negative emotions. And if your client do that, try to uh, help them just share their emotions. They will be very grateful for that, I can tell you. So reappraise them, revisit, understand your emotions. Okay, and ask, okay, what is this emotion telling me now? What is the message? Where do I feel it? Okay, let's move to the last part of this webinar, aha moment. So what happens when there's this light bulb moment? So we're gonna look at that very precisely. And as coaches, this is what we want to offer our clients. Let's look at that. So, you know, it's the brain produce, produces those moments. And two neuroscientists and psychologists have observed the mental shifts uh, that comes with the, those aha moments. Using, um, uh, functional MRI and EEG. And an expert between leadership and neuroscience, David Rock, you might know him, have translated his brain research into a model. It's called the ARIA model. And we can look at that now. This is the four phases of insight. First, awareness of a dilemma. Second, reflection. Three, insight for action. Let's look at them in details. I've picked some picture of the guy. Okay, <clears throat> awareness of a dilemma. Let's take an example. So one of my clients, for instance, he wants to be promoted, but he knows that he doesn't communicate enough on his achievements and what he can bring to the company. No one knows about him. He's not visible, uh, but he needs to do, he needs to communicate more, but he hates that. He thinks it's like bragging. He doesn't like it to do that. So he knows that he has to do it, but he doesn't like to do it. That is dilemma. 
Okay. So what happens when you have this dilemma? You realize that this is your rational brain thinking. It's activated. As a coach, what you can do is please don't try to solve the problem. I'm sure some of you guys were also thinking, oh, but you should do that and that. And I was thinking too, I was like, oh, what did I do when I was in this situation? So try to avoid that, be curious, ask questions. When, what would you like to achieve when this happened, etc. And summarize the problem, don't, don't, don't forget that. Then you ask some questions. So we are about and stress, then I ask him, hmm, which friends could you use to do um, to, to communicate about yourself? Okay, so my client, I saw my client looking up, and whenever my client looks up, I stop, I offer them silence, some space to think, because I know they're thinking. And they shut up, out all the senses to focus on the internal processes. Okay. And he had insight. How? Oh. No, you asked me about my strength. I think I'm good at men. I'm very good at sharing information. I love to empower young people and, and to share about, to solve issues. I hate bragging, but I can share because I care. And what I will do, I will organize a webinar to share about some solutions and I will mentor some people and help them grow in the company. And it was like, and I'm sure it will help me be more visible and people will know about my work, but it won't be me bragging, it will be me sharing and empowering others. So that was, he was very happy with this insight. I was loud, wow, I know what I'm gonna do. So what happened in his brain, there was this uh, lots of uh, energy, a rush of energy. The brain was making new connection, forming a new mental map. Okay, what do you do uh, now as a coach when there's this energy? You need to make sure you don't, you take this energy and you transform it into action because it doesn't last for long. Okay, so this is your chance as a coach to help your client use this energy uh, to create sustainable action points. Okay, let's move to, so this is the ARIA model. So as a coach, you need to observe nonverbal cues to adjust your behavior. Should I ask questions? Should I wait? Should I be silent? Should I make sure that I use this energy to um, transform these insights into action? Okay, hope it helps. And don't forget that using actions is amazing. A uh, question, sorry because questions hijack the brain in a positive way. How do questions hijack the brain? Well, when you hear a question, I don't know if you're still really focused, but when you hear a question, when what happens? And I do ask a lot of questions huh, in my webinars, in my training, because I know that people will be more focused, more engaged, because they will have this, uh, when I ask a question, there's this mental reflex called instinct elaboration and your brain cannot think about anything else and we try to pull uh, information from everywhere in the brain and to find the answer and since we can think about only one thing at a time it will totally your brain will totally focus on finding the answer okay and it will create new connections as we've seen with um, the previous model Okay, so questions are really a catalyst for our brains. There's nothing we know in that problem solving. But to avoid that when it prevents uh, your clients, your employees uh, from developing and learning and taking ownership of solutions. All right, so we're reaching the end of this webinar. Just to recap, so... We've seen as a difference 
between primal and rational brain. We've looked at some uh, cognitive biases. We've looked at our animal instincts and how they overpower our rational uh, thoughts. We've seen, we've discovered how uh, neurons that fire together, the wire together, and that's the principles of neuroplasticity. Our brain is plastic. We can create new neural pathways uh, which help us grow. We don't have a fixed mindset. We can have a growth mindset. Uh, that, uh, our main drivers are not to seek pleasure. Most of the time, it's more to avoid pain. And we need to think about that when we coach people to create sense of urgency and increase motivation to change. Because we know change is hard, right? So we need to use whatever levers we have to help our clients. So do diagnose the problems, the pain, and help your client visualize the gain. Okay, we've seen what emotions are. Uh, we've seen how stress can hijack our brain. Uh, and we have looked at how to become more interoceptive. And last but not least, we've covered the ARIA model. We've looked at this burst of energy that happens right after someone has an insight. And this is a gift for your clients and for yourself. And you have to seize this opportunity to translate, to transform this insight into an action. Okay, whatever we have designed on this webinar is based on neuroscience. We try as much as possible to simplify complex concepts, not to overload your working memory using lots of images, simple example. We try to talk to your primal brain and to use all your senses, you know, physical sensation, what you see, how you feel, to make sure that we um create change changes and um, let's recap what you guys can do as a coach so someone resisting to change you can help them create new habits thanks to neuroplasticity uh, you can help people make uh, rational decisions instead of instinctive ones you can help people uh, reappraise their emotions and suppressing them like we all do. Uh, we should uh, help people move from pain to pleasure, from dilemma to insights, from a fixed mindset to growth mindset. And how do we do that? What are the tools and techniques that we can use? Well, the ladder of learning, I really love this simple model. You can share it with your clients. It's pretty impactful. The biases. Uh, please make sure you educate yourself and your kids around you about that. And it's very important, especially the confirmation bias. Uh, you need to communicate to the primal brain, not the rational brain. And I've seen so many very cerebral coaches uh, just using the rational brain. So try to avoid that, become more interoceptive. And this will cover already and hijack people's brain with questions are the best thing you can do as a coach. So those are some uh, books I highly recommend. So the one from the Nobel Prize, Brain Rules from John Medina. I just published a new one, um, Brain Rules in the Workplace. Goldman, obviously, on emotional intelligence. And the Persuasion Code. Okay, what are your key takeaways? Please share in the chat. I would be happy to know more. Thank you very much, for, guys, for staying with me till the end of this webinar. Uh, feel free to connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn. You can send me an email. You can WhatsApp me. It will be always a pleasure for me to share and discuss with fellow coaches. Have a good one.